Marcia Levitas, who is an associate professor at ASU's Biodesign Institute. She's a physical chemist who has in recent years concentrated on the application of fluorescent spectroscopy to biophysical research. So here you have, we have a technology art artist, scientist, biologist, and now we have a physicist, a biophysicist who's also working on issues that we're um, trying to bring to the public. So Marcia's current interests are focused on the study of the conformational dynamics of biopolymers, which hopefully she will explain, at the single molecule level. Examples include the study of DNA flexibility, DNA protein interactions in nucleosomes, and RNA structure and dynamics. Research in her group also involves the study of photophysical properties of fluorescent probes commonly used in single molecule biophysics, particularly in the context of the quantitative analysis of single molecule data. The Levitas lab is also interested in techniques that allow the manipulation of individual molecules, such as mag using magnetic or laser tweezers, and combining those techniques with fluorescence methods. One of the messages that um, Marcia has helped us bring to the public is that the shape of the molecule really makes a difference in the function of the molecule. So, Marcia, please. Thank you. So, one of the main challenges in medicine today is to find ways to treat and to prevent very complex diseases such as cancer or Alzheimer's. Although we do have some treatments for these diseases, but far from understanding the genetic and environmental causes that lead to these conditions. Human bodies are extremely complex, and there are still many open questions regarding what the molecules of life are doing inside our cells, and how our cells communicate with each other. So, as Chuck said, this is actually a very interesting and exciting time for biomedical research, because although we still have a lot to learn, we are moving at a very fast pace. So, I'm a professor at ASU, and uh, my field of research is called single molecule biophysics. Biophysics is the field of science that acts as a bridge between the biomedical sciences and the physical sciences. We're at a point in time where biology is becoming more and more dependent on physics and math. More and more understanding challenges in the biomedical sciences requires that we collaborate with physicists and mathematicians to understand how the complex interactions in the cell lead to life or being sick. There are many uh, examples of how physics and math are important to understand biology. For example, here in the screen, I have a question of how nerve cells communicate. Nerve cells communicate using very complex electrical signals over very long distances. And the brain is at the helm of all this communication. And I've seen many open questions about how this all happens. We know that nerve cell communication um, matters in terms of how we feel, how we move, and the scientists who are looking into how nerve cells communicate and how the brain is um, uh, connecting all these uh, communications need to be experts in the physics and the math of electric circuits. So there's a lot of physics and a lot of math in terms of how our brain is able to handle all the nerve cell communication we have in our body. Another example of where physics and math matters to understand biology is the question of how the cells transport their cargo. We think of cells as tiny objects, but if you're a molecule, the cell is actually a very large and a very crowded environment. There's almost no empty space in the cell, and to move around, molecules need to be pushed by motors. We do have tiny motors that are proteins that are designed to move large molecules from the place where they're synthesized to the place where they're needed in the cell. As any motor, these proteins need fuel, and we take this energy from the food we eat. The scientists that investigate protein motors borrow and use the same theories that physicists use to describe the large motors we use every day, such as the motor of our car. So we have a lot of physics to understand how things move inside the cell. Maybe one of the main areas where physics is needed to understand biology is the development of new tools to observe and to manipulate biological molecules. 
we know that cells are much, is they're tiny for our eye to see them with the naked eye. So we use microscopes to see cells and try to see what happens inside our cells. In the screen, I have the image of two cells using one of the mes best microscopes we have available today. Now, molecules are much smaller than cells. And if we try to zoom in to see what molecules are doing, we realize that these images are too fuzzy. We can't see what molecules are doing inside our cell, even with the best microscopes we have available today. One of the main challenges we have in the biomedical sciences nowadays is to create better microscopes so we can look at molecules as they perform their function inside our body. Now, to see what we are missing, I want you to look at this picture and see how much detail you can get. You see three dancers, you can see the six arms, you can look at details of how the fingers are pointing down, you see this girl smiling, you see details in their clothing. If these women were cells, and if we would be looking at these dancers under the microscope, this is how they would look like. We wouldn't even be able to see if there are two or three dancers, and we would completely miss all the details. That is more or less how we look at cells nowadays. We do have some detail, but we are missing a lot. So you might be thinking, well, you know, just go and buy a better microscope. But the issue is that we're at a point in time where we reach the best resolution that we can get with light. We can't get any better because we really reach the maximum resolution that the physics of light allows. You may be thinking, why do we have a limit? Why can't we get any better? And the answer lies in the fact that light is a wave. And the size of this wave is much, much larger than the molecules we're trying to see. Because molecules are much smaller than these waves of light, when we try to see molecules with light, we shall see a blurry spot. So we really, um, light is made of waves, and waves of light are not too different from the rings of water that we form when we drop a little stone or some drops of rain. So when we try to look at a small molecule under the microscope, instead of seeing a small molecule, what we see is a large ring of light. And this ring of light is like 200 times larger than the molecule we're trying to see. This creates a problem because we can't see the resolution of what is inside this big, large ring of light. So again, these rings of light are a consequence of light being a wave, and that determines the resolution of light microscopes we have today, and we really reach the maximum resolution we can get. So imagine that you want to see these six dots, imagine they are molecules, and you're trying to image this under the microscope. Because these dots are so small, they're molecules, and are so close together, the large rings of light they produce would overlap, creating a mess. So instead of seeing the six molecules one by one, we would see this blurry spot that is really a mess. It's just a very low resolution image. So to get better images, we will need to violate the laws of physics, and we cannot do that. But we can outsmart physics. So during the last decade, physicists and chemists have been working very hard on finding ways to get pictures with better resolution than what the physics of light allows. And we are just starting to get there. So this is the reality we have today. The idea is actually very simple. But of course, it took very smart people to put it into practice. Imagine that you want to see these two molecules that are so close together that they would produce rings of light that would overlap. Now, what if you can turn one of the molecules off? If one is off, we would see the rings of light of only one molecule. And we would be able to determine the center of that ring of light with a lot of precision. So what we need to do now is to turn this one off, turn the other one on, so we can locate the center of the ring of light of the other molecule. So by turning molecules on and off one by one, we can create images that have much better resolution 
that the images would recreate if all the molecules were on at the same time. Now, you may be thinking, this is really a simple idea. Why nobody thought about this before? As it turns out, there are lots of efforts from physicists, mathematicians, and chemists that lead to these new technologies. Chemists need to find ways of making molecules that can be switched on and off. Chemists need to find ways of putting these molecules in the cell in the place that we need them. And physicists need to find ways of detecting these small signals and constructing microscopes that are able to work with these new technologies. So this is really just starting. These technologies are new maybe in the last decade. And let me show you what we can do today. In blue, we have a picture that is taken with a conventional microscope. That's a microscope that basically is limited by the properties of light. And in green, we have what we call the super resolution image. It's an image that physicists created with these technologies of switching molecules on and off. So we can get now much better resolution, and we can start to think about answering questions of what is going on inside our cells. This is really just starting, and there are many challenges that need to be addressed. These images are really slow to take, and things in the cell move. If we want to see molecules in action, we need to learn ways of measuring this much faster than we can do today. And of course, we would like to do this with different colors. If we can paint different parts of a cell with different colors, then we can see how different parts of a cell interact in real time. Now, as we work on these challenges, there are some challenges in education that I want to address. Because all these requires that we know a lot of physics and a lot of math. In the screen, I have some statistics of 15-year-olds in the, in the whole world in terms of mathematics. And if you can place the US, that's an arrow there, you will see that we are well behind countries like China, Japan, the UK, and Canada. And we actually do spend a lot in education, and that's the graph on the right. So even if we do spend a lot, we still perform worse. We need to raise children that are fluent in skills needed to excel in science, technology, and math. And I always think about toys as one of the things that we need to think about. I just did a quick search in Google, search for toys for girls, and this is what I got. These toys are all makeup, dolls, and playing house. Experts recommend that children will play with toys that foster creative problem solving and enhance the child's special skills. And don't get me wrong, when I was a kid, I played with dolls. I played with my mother's makeup. But I was more than a, I was more into building blocks. So that's me at age four. <laughs> and I still love my building toys. They got more expensive, but I still love building things. So I want to finish with this, in this picture. This is my research lab. I work with graduate students who are getting PhDs in chemistry, physics, and biochemistry. So we need to raise our children so they follow their footsteps. The future of the US science and innovation depends on our ability to get our children excited about math and science. I want to finish with that thought. Thank you for listening.